All right. Welcome to the September 28, 2020 Jamestown Noon Rotary Meeting. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, let's welcome Ben Torkin, who will give our invocation. Thank you. Uh, well, just as we started this, fellowship is at the heart of the Rotary Club and continues to be the major reason, I think, why we all join and remain engaged. For me, this fellowship formed the cornerstone of our Barb and my social and professional relationships. This past Saturday, we joined several Rotarians to celebrate the life of Rotarian Misty Johnson, who passed away earlier this year. Her husband and son remarked to us how much Rotary meant to her and was such an important part of her life. So please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of fellowship, which we enjoy as Rotarians. We thank you for those Rotarians who have graced our tables and enhanced our lives and now live with you in heaven. Some have reminded us to smile and the world smiles with you. And others like Misty have shared their inspirational thoughts through invocations and helped us focus on service above self. Help us now, Lord, as Rotarians to live the four-way test in both what we say and, more importantly, what we do. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. That's a I don't see any guests, uh, excuse me, visiting Rotarians. Uh, Melissa Myers is with us and Paulette Klein, who will be inducted next week. Um, are there any guests that I'm not seeing? All right, to the chat, let me see what that is. Okay. Um, well, welcome, Melissa and Paulette. Be exciting next week for us all. Let's please repeat the four-way test. Okay, here we go again. Oh, of the I things we think, say, or do, number one, is it the truth? The truth. Is it the truth? It, is it fair to all concerned? Fair to all concerned. Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it build with goodwill and better friendship? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? What a great way to run a business, huh? Let's keep that in mind. Um, announcements, I'd like to recognize the Rotary Yours recorder today. is Eric Hardy. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Chris Anderson, for putting these um, meetings up online for everyone to see. So please know that can be a makeup for you. Just let Lisa Goodell know that you watched it. Sherry, do you want to give us a, um, a recap on what happened on the 24th at the, at the mixer? Sure. We had a great time. Um, Saturday night, we had a small but jovial group of people, and we yeah, played Saturday some... or Thursday? Pardon me? Thursday. It was Thursday, Thursday. Wasn't it? Did I say Saturday? I'm yeah. confused. Anyways, it was it was last week. Um, yeah. So we had a great time. The folks that came, and I was going to put up my score sheet, and now I forgot. And so um, we played trivia. We ha everybody did a wonderful time. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think. I, who all was there? Help me out. I should have had my report ready. So Vince was there. The Joneses were there. The Troxels were there. The Sandbergs were there. Ruth London was there. Deb Morlock was there. Uh, Vicki was there for a while with us. And who Pat did Kinney. I forget? Pat Kinney. And Pat Kinney. I got a nice note from Pat Kinney. I think everybody had a great time. We played three rounds of trivia. And um, I believe the Troxels finished in first. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we had a good time and we I've had some good feedback, so we hope to do it again. 
Wonderful. Yeah. That was very Thank good. So Thank much, you for Sherry. putting that together, Sherry. Oh, it was a lot nice. of fun. And I, yeah, I know a few people wore their party hats and we chatted for a while, did a little icebreaker and the trivia was fun and somewhat challenging, but you know, it was and fun. And the Sandbergs were on the beach because they had some kind of fancy high tech oh, background true. and even had moving waves. <laughs> that's true. I think that we were well, well represented. She's in the weeds right now. We hope some more people will join us next time, but it was a lot of fun. And you, everybody got a makeup. I emailed the makeups into Lisa. All right. Yeah. Oh, great. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, Mike's not on. Uh, highway cleanup, Vince, do you want to tell us what's coming up? Oh, yeah. I've got some updated information. Um, on Friday night, uh, there was a reconnaissance mission that was tasked. Um, we we had uh, Rotarians, uh, Sue and uh, Greg Jones with me, in addition, my wife, of course, and of course I was driving, but we noticed uh, trash uh, between I-86 and Faulkner was very unsightly, and uh, it is proof now, beyond a doubt, we will deploy this Saturday at 8.30. We will muster at 8.30 sharp, 8.30 sharp. And uh, we will ensure you have the proper attire. Uh, some people are concerned about the weather. I have to remind you, you are Rotarians. You do not care about the weather. You care about service above self. The four-way <laughs> test was just announced by everyone. I will see you 8.30. We have a baker's dozen of Rotarians signed up. There still is time. Um, don't forget gloves and the mask for the photo op. And uh, we will prevail Saturday, October 3rd at 8.30. We will bag it. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Any other announcements from committee chairs? <clears throat> All right, not hearing any. Um, I've got to share my screen, so hold on with me here. All right, you can see that. We cannot. We cannot. Nope. What am I doing oh. wrong? Now we can. Okay. Now we, we can. Now we can. Oh. Okay. All right, well, uh, you're going to get a strange PowerPoint picture here. But anyway, I have to tell you, Jake Trans. He needs to get an honorary membership. Unbelievable job this man has done for us. Um, he stepped right up, as you know, from last week, and he <clears> said <throat> he was very excited to ride for us and honored. And, you know, he rode in memory of his friend John Silo and his father-in-law, Mike Strons, who was a longtime Rotarian. So this is day one. He rode 50 miles. He rode in memory of his friend, John Silo. Down there, I've got the donation button. Uh, we've raised $425 so far through that um, link. You can also send a check to our RCJCSF um, if you would like, and we'll send it on. So he wrote to me, thanks, Joni, for coordinating everything, because I didn't want him to have to deal with money at all. That's all, that's what we're doing, and he's doing the ride. He says, I'm so honored your club asked if I would consider riding. Not only is the money going to fight polio, but it's another way I can honor the legacy of two great men, my good friend, John Silo, and father-in-law, Michael Strong. I rode some 50 miles today through beautiful Chautauqua County. These roads are some of my favorites and that of John as well. So I'm dedicating today to the memory of John. My next ride will be dedicated to Mike, and I've attached pictures. So you can see there his route. He actually wasn't very far from my place of residence, right on the Pennsylvania line. So the second day, he says, I just finished 37 miles. This was on Sunday, yesterday, at 1.30 in the afternoon. I just finished about 37 miles in memory of Mike Strong's. My goal was to ride 37 miles for the 37 years he was a proud member of your club. It was a beautiful fall morning through Kennedy, Freesburg, and Jamestown. Now he's, now he's going to share a story, so it's kind of, kind of fun. 
While riding on Route 62 in Poland near Hartson Road, I recalled a ride John Silo, Ken Lansker, and I did a few years back after work. We passed a horse and buggy and found out soon enough the young Amish boy's driver didn't want to be passed. He was determined to pass up. So we raced on bikes saying, we can't let him pass us. Come on, pedal faster, faster, faster. We heard the loud galloping horse gaining on us. And within a few minutes, Ken Lasker got past with added help from the horse who was, mm, you know, pooping and had to ride through all the fresh natural road cookie goodness. Ken was covered in it. But John and I never got past, so we didn't get past by the horse and buggy. Lucky for us. So please feel free to feel free to sh share any of this with your highly respected club. I wrote him back and said, thank you so much. You, you just don't know how great this is for us. And he said, that's terrific. My involvement has helped me so much cope with the passing of my dear friend, John, and the wonderful work Rotary tackles every year. My dad, Mike Strong, loved Rotary, and I remain in awe of all the important charitable issues your club is committed to help fixing. Service about the self is a timeless character mission statement, which I wholeheartedly follow. And he did with this. Hope this fundraiser brings the financial support of your generous members. Thanks, Jake Strong. So if you see Jake, give him a big round of applause. Yes, Tori, we should clap for Jake. Fantastic work. So we'll be sending him some kind of thank you. I'm not sure what, but um, anybody has some good ideas, let me know, let's share. I'm gonna stop sharing now and go back to the real world. Here we are. Um, I will put up, I will send an email again. I'm not gonna mess with the chat, but I'll send an email again with that link for the donation. If you would like to, like I've said, we've already raised $425. Number of people have given 50, a few have given 25. So whatever you can do. Our goal is 1,500 and we certainly can do that with our um, membership size. All right, new members have been proposed by the membership committee. You received an e email about that in the 10 day um, time period that we have to raise our, uh, voice our concerns. They are Paulette Klein and Melissa Myers. So if you have a concern, please let me know uh, by Sunday because we will, we're will planning to induct them next Monday. We also have a special thing happening next Monday, even as special as new members, which is fantastic. So really try to make it next Monday. There's going to be some great stuff happening. Because of the new member inductions next week, um, I've asked Greg to move the October birthdays to October 19th. So if you're not good, Greg. If you're an October birthday, please plan to attend every week, but especially the 19th. All right, well, now we're getting to something a little drier. For your information, the Rotary Board of Directors at the last, uh, from the last meeting and between, have approved the following media policy. The Jamestown Noon Rotary Club, a private membership organization, welcomes the local media to attend our meetings. However, any questions that the media representative wishes to present to our guest speakers must be presented to the Rotary Club president prior to the meeting. This policy may also be in effect during other meetings dependent on the nature of the meeting. So that is our new media policy. Um, given, we just want things to go a little smoother. Are there any other announcements for the benefit of the club? No, nope, not seeing any. How about some happy bucks? I, I would chime in with um, happy bucks for um, Jake and for his willingness to step forward. And if you don't know Jake and you might not because he is just, he basically makes the community foundation run, um, but he's, behind the scenes and he's not he's not out there in all the pictures um but if you don't i mean he is just as good-hearted as that email sounds and um and he really um it meant a lot to him to be asked to do this on behalf of our club because he has uh 
He's a Lions uh, Club, former Lions Club member himself, but he has always respected Rotary. He used to have lunch every Saturday with um, Mike and Kenny Strickler and some other Rotarians. So um, just, I, I would, I'd pay a lot of money uh, to say thanks to Jake and um, such a good guy. And I also wanted to pay a happy buck um, on behalf of lifelong Rotarians. Um, so even though they might not be members of our club anymore, um, Jane Becker reached out to me and asked if she could get me a check to support our, uh, our polio fundraising efforts. So it just goes to show that even though folks might not be in our membership any longer or attending our meetings, um, our mission and our purpose is never far from their heart. Thank you, Tori. Other happy books? I have uh, one uh, because all of our students' appointments, my appointments are in Buffalo and I can't drive because my leg doesn't work and Sue can't drive because her arm doesn't work. I thought if she got in the driver's seat and, and uh, pushed the pedals and I could reach over with my hands and drive. <laughs> but she said maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So my happy bucks are to the Horrigans. They have gone back and forth to Buffalo several times. Actually, Barb Horrigan is there again today with my wife. So when you talk about service above self and good friends, there are two of them. So thank you to the horror guns. Here, here. That's Lord. wonderful. Here. I'm here. Happy to do it. Very nice. Oh, just one. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Well, I, I guess I better do a happy box for coming in and a close first and front of Vince at <laughs> trivia the other night. It was nip and tuck and there were a couple tricky questions in there, but uh, I think I had Marissa on my team and uh, that pulled me through. So I got a happy buck for coming and getting the blue ribbon and trivia. <laughs> and uh, also what Vince said about uh, Misty, I just want to say that too. I mean, when I think about Misty, I always think of her invocations, which were really sweet and heartfelt and inclusive for all of us. So uh, that was a good function yeah. we went to the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for going. All right. I'm going to ask everyone to mute except Walt Pickett because he is going, he's our speaker. And I'd like to um, read the um, introduction for him. All right. Oh, wait, I got to put my... Anyway, I got to put my glasses on, small. Our speaker today has enjoyed a wide range of interests and careers. Walt Pickett holds a bachelor's in biology and a bachelor's in communication with a master's degree in cardiopulmonary physiology, all from Fairleigh Dickinson University. He did graduate work in mass communication at SUNY Amherst and is board registered in respiratory care and as a sleep specialist. Walt has been an adjunct faculty member at the NYU School of Medicine and at the NYU MS program in physical therapy. He served as department chair at Brookdale Community College in New Jersey in allied health and has taught broadcast journalism and public speaking at nearby Houghton College. He's worked as director of education in the anesthesiology department of Jersey City Medical Center Technical Director of Respiratory Care at NY University Hospital and as Director of Cardiopulmonary Services at Olean General Hospital. He has worked in the sleep labs at WCA and Warren Hospitals. Walt was Operations Manager at WFBS in Buffalo and was an on-air program host on radio in Newark, Wellsville, and Bath, New York. His career would be an interesting program in itself but he has something else to speak to us about today. Walt? Well, thank you, yeah. It, um, my career represents what happens to anybody who tries to figure out what they'd like to do when they grow up. And since I'm not there yet, I'm not sure what it's gonna be. I think at the moment it's being a writer, which I'm enjoying a lot. Uh, I had a, have had a fantastic opportunity to get to know somebody that uh, apparently almost nobody uh, has ever heard of. But uh, Kay, are you still online? They're there. There's everybody say yes, hi to uh, Kay Magnuson. Kay, can you wave? I don't know if you can hear me. Wave. There's Kay. Um, we're going to talk about Kay's father. 
a truly absolutely remarkable guy. I've never had such an interesting time getting to know a person who's passed a long time ago, but if you spend three years going through somebody's papers and FBI surveillance reports on somebody, you really feel like you get to know him. And Kay's father, a fellow named Larry Haas, was truly a remarkable individual. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. I think if I can, oops. Okay, the host has disabled Larry. So um, I also need to pull up my PowerPoint. Wait a minute, I'm gonna make you host, hold on. Okay. Uh, where'd you go? You at the bottom? There you go. Okay. So now if I share screen, we should be on, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it says disabled screen sharing. Wait a moment. I apologize. I always I'm told my students to <laughs> Okay. I always told my students to show up early to make sure the bells and whistles work. So I just flunked this class. Thank you very much. Yes. Hmm. That's your host now. Okay, there we go. I can take it from here. Uh, Kay's father was a remarkable individual. The book that uh, Kay and I have been working on is called The Threat. The remarkable untold story of the FBI's very first counter-espionage case against the Soviet Union. What's interesting is that um, Kay had asked me to, to um, tell a story about her dad and all by himself, he's a remarkable story. But as we started to research, even beyond what Kay knew, we found out that her dad was involved in the very first case the FBI ever took on against Soviet spies. And um, it gets even crazier from there, fascinating story. Uh, if you can see the uh, right side of the screen here, uh, there you go. Red spies paid for jet, jet secrets. The untold story, the FBI and a courageous American scientist, that was Kay's father. Um, what's interesting is, and I think very few people have heard about this. I didn't know this before myself. Everybody's heard about the uh, Soviet spies trying to steal the atomic bomb secrets. Been hundreds of books written about that. But their very second priority was to steal the secrets on how to build a jet airplane. And uh, that story actually, after three years of research, we realized has never been told. So there are four main players in this. One is Larry Haas. That's the case dad on the left. Uh, Warren, Larry, George Haas. The main player number two is Bell Aircraft the Niagara Falls Buffalo plant of uh, Bell Aircraft. And the fellow on the right is a Soviet agent named Andrei Ivanovich Shevchenko. Very interesting guy in his own right. Uh, a great story about him. If you are a Soviet citizen in the 1940s, Stalin said, no matter where you go in the world, you will be a spy. Your job is to steal whatever you can with your eyes and your ears and send it back to Russia. Well, Andrei Shevchenko was not by temperament a spy. As a matter of fact, when he was a teenager, he took his balalaika, threw it over his shoulder, uh, took a backpack and spent two years wandering the Caucasus Mountains with the gypsies. <laughs> now, that's an adventure beyond anything I could imagine. Probably takes some of us back to the hippie days, but he was pretty, uh, pretty extreme at it. But he said he quit hanging out with gypsies when he found out that if you make love to a gypsy woman, you've got to marry her. Shortly after finding that out, he wound, found himself back in, in Moscow really quickly. But like a lot of people in the 30s, late 20s and 30s, aircraft was just a remarkable miracle. You know, it was only a few decades since people said heavier than aircraft could never leave the ground. So he signed up and became a student at the Moscow Institute of Aviation. He became an aviation engineer. So um, 
<laughs> so we'll get back to Andre soon, but a very interesting fellow. Number four, the fourth major player in this story is Kay Haas. And that's Kay on the left and her dad. Sorry, Kay, I didn't tell you I was going to show that picture. But uh, you're just as cute today as you were then, I'm sure. Uh, everybody can tell. <laughs> I can see you smiling there. And that's Kay. Uh, the word Haas in German means rabbit. So all of her life, Kay's been known as Bunny. The rest of her name is Marker Magnuson. So now you know who we're talking about. So at this point, I'm going to read just a, a few paragraphs out of our introduction because it'll really set the stage for what, uh, what sort of a life Kay and her dad experienced. There was a time when nobody thought machines heavier than air could leave the ground. Ether waves could not carry words and pictures. The most learned men believed it. Only charlatans and troublemakers thought otherwise. But by the early 20th century, the mavericks found new ways to see the world especially scientists and engineers, had started to change the world. Larry Haas was one of those men. Larry was an aeronautical engineer in the early 20th century, when taming the air still seemed like a miracle to many people. Propellers made winds that nature could not match, and they lifted sleek machines into the air. That new wind could also do great damage. Larry Haas knew that because he designed and he built engine for the propeller-driven warplanes of World War II. In the 1930s, aviation was still so new that its pioneers were almost all self-taught men, like Larry Haas. Larry banked on three skills. <laughs> These are three remarkable skills. Some of us have some of them, but not all of us have all of them. He had a knack for learning fast. He had a quick wit, but most of all, he could tell a lie that anybody would believe. In less than a decade after high school, that third skill propelled him from a humble milkman to the greatest heights in science and engineering. Unfortunately, that skill also launched him into espionage and brought injury and death to his family. Larry Haas's story has never been told. And his story is also the untold story of the Federal Bureau of, of Investigation, their first ever investigation of a Soviet spy operating inside the United States. But Larry Haas did not want his story told, and his daughter Kay did not want to tell it, merely to tell a good tall tale. He meant it to show the unchanging nature of realpolitik at every level, from intensely personal to geopolitical. Soviet spies in America during World War II had a thousand targets to prove. They needed useful information to send home to their country, struggling against Hitler's terrible onslaught. What the Russians needed was invincible weapons. Desperation forced their spies to two great priorities. Number one was how to build an atomic bomb. Number two was how to build a jet-powered war. Both of those radically new technologies were top secret developments by their worst enemy, Germany, and by their best ally, the United States. The obvious choice then for Soviet spies was to spy on their best friend, America, because they could hide in plain sight, you know, whatever they wanted. So that kind of sets, this, sets the story. 1903, the Wright brothers, 1936, the DC-3, 1942 to 45, Larry Bell created these three airplanes. Larry Bell's uh, air, airplanes were in incredibly instrumental in the Second World War. But here's the 60 second history lesson for those who don't remember. Hitler and Stalin signed a non-aggression pact saying they would not attack each other. Stalin had at least 42 messages from his spies telling him Hitler was about to attack. Stalin never believed him. On June 22, 1941, the largest invasion force in the history of the world, 1.2 million men, Germans, crossed the border into Russia. Within 24 hours, they decimated the world's largest air force. That was the Soviet Air Force. 
and I had never known before that the Soviets had such an enormous air force, air force as early as 1941. But within 24 hours, in flames. So, by the way, I suppose if you're invaded by a neighbor who you thought was a friend, you're going to be paranoid. The Russians come by their paranoia, paranoia honestly. So they needed spies to learn how to build jet planes. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what we learned about the two spies toolkit. Larry Haas was not a spy, he was a counter spy. He had to learn what Andrei Shevchenko was doing. Spies use seductive mice. Mice stands for money, ideology, compromise or coercion, and ego. Soviet Union believed in the long seduction. They would take a year or two or even three to get information out of you by trying to befriend you with one of those four incentives. If they could buy you, and we know that there are many Americans who have old American down the river, huge amounts of money. Money didn't attract Larry Haas. Ideology, well, if you, um, believed in the communist um, ideology, you might be willing to spy for the Soviets in those days. Few of us remember, in the 1930s and 40s, a vast swath of the American intellectual community thought that communism was almost the second coming of a messiah. Huge parts of American society thought that their theory on spreading the wealth, no more poverty, everybody equal, was so good that lots of Americans agreed to spy for the Soviet Union. They thought communism was the best thing since sliced bread. On the other hand, if that didn't work, you could be compromised. If they could get you hooked on drugs or uh, sexual escapades, or if they could use coercion, they would use that. And if that, if not that, they looked for people who wanted to be 007. Nothing of that worked on Larry Haas. So before we get to the P-59, well, yeah, the P-59, this was um, Larry Bell's greatest first invention. Larry Bell was like Larry Haas. Uh, he was a great aviation pioneer, but he never even graduated from high school. He got out of high school, he, he left high school and said, I'd rather build airplanes. I don't know how, but I'm gonna try. But within a couple of years, he had one of the biggest contracts the U.S. government had ever let for air. He built the P-39. It was revolutionary because he put the engine behind the pilot in the back of the plane. So there would be more room for a cannon and ammunition up front. They called it the cannon on wings. Russian uh, pilots loved it. But unfortunately, that plane was castrated. That's what the Russians called it. The United States Air Forces asked Larry Bell to build this airplane for the war, but they wanted it lighter and they wanted it cheaper. So they took out the supercharger and the plane was unable to fly high anymore. So once, the, once Larry Bell did what the Air Force wanted, the plane became almost unflyable. The US Air Force wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. So the U.S. decided, well, if we can't sell it to our own Air Force, we'll sell it to the Russians. And the Russians bought them by the thousands, six or seven thousand of these and about three thousand of an upgraded version later on. And the Soviet flyers were some of the bravest, most creative um, flyers ever to enter the Second World War. They turned that plane into the deadliest weapon the German Air Force ever saw. So what the Russians did is they sent Andrei Shevchenko to America to work at the Bell Aviation plant to inspect all these B-39s that were being sent to Russia. He was in the plant where Larry Haas was and they had to work together. Here, Stalin's Falcons, they were called, Soviet pilots. It wasn't the airplanes, it was the pilots. 
um, Russian uh, ace Alexander Prokhrushchev. At the time of this picture was taken, I counted the stars. He had 55 kills in a Bell 359 against the Luftwaffe. Eventually, 59. So he was deadly. He did something the Falcons do. They attack their prey from high and behind. So they would crawl this airplane as high as he could get, fall behind the Germans, and then dive. And the diving would give them the speed the plane couldn't give them. And they would blow the Germans out of the sky before they even knew they'd been targeted. So Larry Haas was at Bell, and Andrei Shevchenko was at Bell. And Andrei Shevchenko suspected Bell was up to more than P-39s. This is the only known photograph of Larry Haas teaching. But you have to understand how Larry Haas got to be a teacher. After he graduated from high school, he went to, took a one semester popular course in aircraft. How do airplanes fly? It was a very popular thing in the day, like the early days of computers. You might take a course called Fun with Computers. He took a course about fun with aircraft. He learned more than the course held. Then he went to work for Curtis Wright, Wright Brothers and uh, Glenn Curtis building airplanes. He went to Chevrolet to learn how to build aircraft engines. And then, and this is the part about the big lie. This is one of the first things Kay told me about her dad. His whole career came from his one big lie. He learned more than anybody expected wherever he worked. So he went to Bell Aircraft and said, I have a university degree in aeronautical engineering. That was a big lie. But war was on, manpower shortage was great. He didn't have the internet to check somebody's background. So they said, great. You can sign on. So there he was at Bell Aviation under the lie that he was an aeronautical engineer. He took a night shift job in maintenance so that he could break in the library every night and read. Within three months, he had read so much that he was teaching other aircraft engineers aeronautical engineering principles within three months of signing on at Bell. Now that's a bright guy. Within a year, he was on the scientific research team at Bell. Within a year after that, he was part of upper management at Bell Aviation. At that point, he found out that Bell was working on a top secret program to build the Allies' first jet aircraft. And that's what Andrei Shevchenko found out. His new friend, Larry Bell, had all the secrets Soviet government wanted for their second highest priority. But of course, the library at Bell, it's a huge plant. They needed a lot of smart people. The library had a librarian named Leona, uh, Leona Franey. Um, you can see her finger poised just like any librarian. Shh, quiet. She was a tough lady. She was impossible to seduce, but Shevchenko never stopped trying that either. Without her wall. So having noticed that this Soviet um, engineer was socializing with people like uh, Larry Haas and Leona Bell. He would take them out to dinner, just try to get to know them, try to befriend them, hoping to get under their skin a little bit. The FBI noticed what was going on. And one day there was a knock on Larry Haas's door. The FBI agents came in and they said very briefly, you got two choices. Mm -hmm. We either arrest you as a collaborator with Soviet spies or you work for us. What do you like? That was a very, very tough question to throw at somebody. However, Larry Haas was a patriot, he decided to work with the FBI. So Bell built the P-39, the P-63, and ultimately the P-59. The very first jet aircraft ever designed and built by the Allies. However, this airplane just wasn't good enough for combat. It was able to put a jet engine on a plane, and Larry Haas was the engineer who helped build this 
jet engine and stick it on an aircraft. But unfortunately, there was another company working on jet planes at the same time, Westinghouse. Well, uh, on, somehow, a spy like Shevchenko knew what nobody else knew. Westinghouse and Bell were working in such secret that neither company knew the other was working on research for dead aircraft. There were about five people in the, United, in the entire United States who knew about these parallel top secret programs. One of them was Andrei Shevchenko because he was a spy and he had a network that could find it out for him. The other was Larry Haas. He transferred to Westinghouse because he felt he'd learned all he could at Bell. And this is Larry Haas at the bottom of the picture on the left with the white shirt and the hat on. He bought a Grumman F6F Hellcat, a Hellcat with folding wings built for landing on an aircraft carrier. The Navy wanted a jet to land on an aircraft carrier. So Larry Haas helped develop that jet for Westinghouse. Remember, he's only a few years now from being a milkman who thought aircraft were interesting. I've got to be one of the uh, most um, brilliant uh, minds I've ever heard of, because from there, he moved on up in later years. Same thing. I'm sure everyone's heard of the Polaris submarine. Larry Haas's work on turbines positioned him to be one of the engineers to develop the Polaris submarine, the world's first nuclear submarine. The turbine, the power plant of that was partially Larry Haas's work. And I don't know how many remember the story about um, the China syndrome. Where, um, Jack Lemon plays a nuclear safety engineer, finds a company cutting corners, building America's first nuclear reactor. That movie was also built on Larry Haas's life. That was his experience and the company that he um, reported for cutting corners, tried to assassinate him, uh, uh, run him, ran him off the road, and he spent three years in the Middle East hiding. So his life got very, very interesting very quickly. He also worked on a project to develop a nuclear-powered jet bomber for the American Air Force. It was scrapped, but that's a program that was quite unusual. So one of the problems was during the Second World War, what do you do with a spy, the FBI? because of Larry, had an ironclad case. They could nab this Soviet spy, who by then had been promoted, as a matter of fact. Andrei Shevchenko was promoted to the second highest position in the United States. He had billions of dollars under his control, purchasing everything the United, that the Soviet Union needed from the Lund Lease program. He was about as high as you would get in the United States. And the FBI and Larry Haas had him dead to rights. But somebody in Washington, D.C. refused to prosecute Shevchenko. For 75 years, historians have been wondering who in Washington blocked prosecution of this spy. We are the first person who knows the answer to that. We found it in J. Edgar Hoover's own handwriting on Sarah Michael Harry Haas's papers. We'll be publishing that shortly. I'll let you wait until you buy the book and find out who that was. But that mystery has been solved after 75 years. However, because Washington refused to prosecute, J. Edgar Hoover felt he'd been cr crossed by his government. His very first case was a failure because he couldn't nab the spy he really could catch. So anybody who's studied J. Edgar Hoover knows that he had devious ways. He decided to try Shevchenko in the press with what's called an unauthorized leak. See at the bottom here, Howard Rushmore was a journalist who worked with people like J. Edgar Hoover 
get a story that he would deny where it came from, Hoover worked with Larry Haas to publish the entire story to um, expose Shevchenko's entire spy network in the newspaper, made front page headlines three days in a row in the Journal American in New York City. So that Shevchenko was stopped and the United States government had nothing to do with it. Unfortunately, however, it didn't put Shevchenko in prison. People have also been waiting for 75 years to find out what happened to him. We know the answer. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll spoil it for you right now by telling you the full answer, though. Um, but it's definitely something tied up with Kay Haas's dad, a truly remarkable individual. So this very first FBI case against the Soviet Union was a failure. However, justice was meted out extrajudicially, extrajudicially um, in ways that would probably make it in a 007 movie. But the Washington blame game in 1949, three years after the war, three years after Shevchenko was exposed, people in Washington were still saying, why was he never prosecuted? So the House Un-American Activities Committee, which later became better known as the, um, you know, um, <laughs> who was it that uh, was after all the communists? Um, yeah, and it suddenly went blank. But here's Larry Haas, Kay's mom, Dorothy. And here is um, Leona Franey, Dorothy. the librarian that Shevchenko tried to seduce her into giving him top secret documents out of the library. One of the things Shevchenko found out was that Leona Franey's husband, Joe, was working on the Manhattan Project nearby at uh, Booker Chemical. So Shevchenko thought he had really, really struck it rich. He had the secrets of jet propulsion and he had an in to the Manhattan Project on the atomic bomb. And he was stopped in all cases because he never got the information he wanted. But um, HUAC decided three years after the war to investigate and try to find out why the spy was never caught. They never found out. But Larry Haas's testimony is fascinating reading if you ever look for uh, this particular set of hearings from June 6, 1949. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, wait, be the Cold War years, uh, Larry Haas remembered one of the um, FBI agents said to him, remember, peace is just another name for the pause while the next war is being planned. And that's a pretty cynical look at it, but if you look at history, it's also pretty accurate. During the Cold War years, Larry Haas traveled all over Europe. They found out, as a matter of fact, that he also had homes in Lebanon and in Italy. He had a full-time bodyguard and chauffeur in Europe. Nobody in his family even knew about that until uh, Kay's sister went along on one of the European trips. Um, he always had that gleam in his eye, you can see here. Uh, this was in the Middle East with um, dignitaries from Iraq. Um, so those, um, he flew under the radar. He spent most of his life trying to make sure nobody knew what he was up to. But he continued to work with the FBI in counter-espionage throughout the rest of his life. And because of that, his story was never told. Um, Get him. The rest of the story is that Kay was used in a coercive manner by Soviet agents all the way through the 1960s. She was abducted as a little girl and there were six other assassination attempts on her life to coerce Larry into working for the Soviets. But if you can imagine surviving altogether seven assassination attempts by Russian secret agents, uh, you can realize that Kay is not quite ordinary um, 
petite little lady you think she is. I sat next to her once at her dining room table and said, how could you have crushed the nose of a Russian spy like a raw egg? You get away with it. And before I knew it, she had put her arm next to mine or her hand on my elbow and I was on the floor. The, an amazing move totally uh, blew me away. But yes, she's the kind of a person who could survive seven assassination attempts. So um, next time you see Kay, be real nice to her. Don't mess with Kay. <laughs> yes, sir. Next time you see uh, The final word. This is uh, from Kay's words from the book. In his very last hours on November 27, 1989, I sat beside my dad's bed with him and his wife for nearly 20 good years, fading twilight of a, that rainy Monday afternoon as a cold autumn wind moaned among the treetops above his home. My father found a measure of comfort in proposing one last plan from his deathbed. It was no less audac audacious than all the others that had shaped his life. I am to tell my story, Kate. He left his life in my hands. I gave him my promise, and now I've kept it. So that's Kay Haas's story, and it's Larry Haas's story. There's a great deal in it that the world has never known answers to important questions. Uh, we now have an agent and a um, publisher that we'll be meeting with tomorrow uh, who agree this story has never been told. And uh, so it's a first and it's a real, real page turner in real life. It, uh, Stalin was not a man to be messed with. Um, unfortunately, um, dealing as a counter spy, very, very risky. So at this point, I'll turn it back to uh, everybody. Uh, um, you can unmute. I'm not sure how to do that from here. Not here. I'd be interested okay. in a question. Hope you found K interesting. Uh, Jim Roselli told me years ago, and I think a lot of folks will remember that. Everyone is a story. Nothing. I'm sure next time we get together, you look around all the tables, you'll see a lot more stories than you know about. Senator Joe McCarthy. Joe McCarthy, that's the name I was trying to think of. Thanks, Greg. Yep. Um, one of the interrogators that uh, spoke to Larry Haas was a young fellow from California named Richard Nixon. And uh, Larry and Richard became good friends in years to come. The person uh, interrogated shortly after that was uh, Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. And Larry and Robert Oppenheimer became friends. Uh, it was often at Larry's home. Kay remembers uh, meeting him, spending time with him as well. So that's, uh, it's quite likely that nothing has changed. What, what we hear in the news is only a superficial, plausible explanation for what's really happening behind the scenes. Now, I don't know if that reminds anybody of um, anything that might be going on today in Washington. But um, things are not always what they seem to be on the surface. Thank you, Walt. Unfortunately, there's uh, we're running out of time here. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Greg is clapping. Everyone should clap. Wonderful. We can't wait to see the book in hand. Next week, our Speaker is Acting County Executive PJ, excuse me, Interim County Executive PJ Wendell, and we will be inducting two members, and we will have a special guest who will be joining us, so please don't miss it. Remember, Rotary opens opportunities, so what opportunities are you going to see this week and make for our community to be a better place? Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. You too. You have a clock. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Oh, long set. Yeah, it was a long. There's Walt. Hey, Walt. Hey, <laughs> I can't get this off my screen. That's a... 
Well, uh, that's okay. We, uh, we had a difficult time. I had to go to the phone because I couldn't hear anything clearly on my computer. And then uh. after I got on the phone, when you started presenting, you were a little too far away from the mic on your computer for us to hear clearly. So it was a bit of a frustrating situation. I'm sorry. But from what we saw and heard, you did a great job. I love the way you left it hanging at the end. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, there's just no way to spoil it. Sorry for everybody. That wouldn't have been any fun at all. That's right. Um, That's right. It's wonderful. Well, um, wouldn't mean anything I'm, at all. I'm not sure I can get this off, off my screen right now. Um, well, PowerPoint maybe. is still a bit of a mystery to me. <laughs> Well, you're not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. I finally got it off. Well, you can just exit right out of um, the, com you know, your computer on the little X there. Yeah, I can there. Yeah, but uh, be gone. I got Zoom on. Okay, we're gone. Okay. Thanks. Shall we call you? Yes, uh, give me a call. Okay, we will do. I didn't think it went. 